Okay, hello. Uh, we're going to tell you how, to, how embedded programming is good for money. Mm -hmm. I'm Noah, and this is Keith. And the slides are all available at the link that he skipped through. Sorry, yeah, slides are available there. All right, so uh, first of all, what is competitive programming? So it's just a time-limited competition where you're given uh, a certain number of problems to solve, usually like between one and seven. Uh, you get a score based on sometimes get partial marks uh, if you partially solve a problem. Uh, you can do the competitions online or you can do them in person at some sort of hub. Depends on the competition. Uh, some of them are in teams, some of them are individual competitions. And some of them only allow you to enter in certain programming languages, and some of them are fine with whatever. So basically, the yeah, is pretty much the same problem. So here are some example competitions that we've done. So the hash code, you're a team of two to four. You're given one problem to solve over four hours. And you submit it online, but there's a hub here in DC where we all gathered together to do it. And you could write your code in any language at all. It didn't matter. Uh, alternatively, another competition is NWR, which was based in Sweden, Linköping University. Uh, all competitors have to be there, and they all have to be students to enter. And it was all Java, C, or C++, and there were 11 problems all over 5 hours. Mm -hmm. So why do you care about competitive programming? Well, money. Money. So it looks great on a CD, and having a good CD helps you get in the door for an interview. Money. Money. So it's good practice in programming. Because it's your fault. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. So it's good practice in programming, algorithms, teamwork, humility, being beaten by other better programmers encourages you to be a better person and also encourages you to learn more. You want to take this? this so, money. You can sometimes get to travel. There's nothing more money than going on vacay. <laughs> um, competitive program problems and interview problems are pretty much the same thing, except that competitive program problems are usually harder, which means that if you, if you study these and could solve these, then you'll have no trouble in an interview, ever. Yeah, it makes the whole process much easier. And that means money. Money. So you learn to be a faster, more efficient at uh, problem solving, coding, testing, which are all uh, good things to be at programming. And that means you get paid better, because you're a better programmer. Money. So we've established now competitive programming is equal to money. That explains the title, basically. Yeah. So now we're going to through, go through how you can actually get involved and solve the problems for you. So who are we? I'm Noah. I'm the Redbrook Secretary. I'm first year at the SSD. That's my website. I was on team uh, representing Ireland at the IOI in Kazakhstan last year. And uh, I'm Kian Ruan, I'm CPSD1 as well. I wasn't on the team for Kazakhstan, but I was very close. And I'm still better. <laughs> so our combined profit altogether from competitive programming is zero. Mm. But we've also got internships and lots of, and a number of women, because zero is still a number. <laughs> and we've also become better programmers through it. I don't think I would have got the internship if I wasn't in competitive programming. Yeah, same for me. I mean, at my job last summer, it was the only thing on my CV. I didn't even have to interview, they just let me in. So we're going to teach you how to be lead programmers like us and come 74th in the NMERC. Yep. Which we're very proud of. the top 75% of the competition. Yeah. Because that's money. So we're going to go through some sample problems. Just a couple of quick problems, yeah. What does it look like? Well, we've got a description of the problem. That's laying out what the problem's about, if there's a theme to it or anything. We've got uh, inputs, it's just uh, describing what your program will actually receive. So in this case, two integers, x and y. And, and then, outputs, what well, the program is expected to give back once it's given these inputs. And you, this will be based on what the description of the problem was. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you'll be given an actual example that you can use to work through and help you understand the problem. So here you can see, we made three money and two money. We have to give back the sum of them, so it's five money. You have to lay out exactly the format they asked for, or else it's marked as wrong. You can white space and throw you off. But that is money. And that's money. So, how it all works. Your solutions run through test cases. And there are separate run-throughs of your solution given different inputs. And the output is pre-calculated. And your output is compared to what they're expecting. 
And if you get it right, you get it right. If you get it wrong, you don't get the points. And usually there's a time limit. So um, if your solution doesn't give the output or doesn't finish executing for the time limit, then it's marked as wrong or time limit exceeded, and then you get no points. So you have to uh, you have to be uh, certain. You have to reach a certain efficiency uh, for it to actually be accepted. And you will usually be able to see how it did in the competition. So uh, on the judge, how, how it went. If it crashed, if it went over time, if you got it right, if you got it wrong. But um, there's one thing to remember, and that's the judge, like your lecturer, is never wrong. Pretty much. Although we trust the judge a lot more than the lecturer. So what that means is, if you think you have the right solution, and the judge tells you, no, that's wrong, the judge, the judge isn't the one making the mistake there. It's you, no matter what, pretty much. You have to so assume that, anyhow. If it says time to exceed it, don't go complaining to anybody. It means you don't have the right solution. You have to optimize it. So here's a real world problem mm -hmm. that uh, was the AIPO, AIPO preliminary round last year, last question on it. Uh, so basically the whole idea is you're given uh, a certain range, be it like uh, 1,000 to 1,020, and you have to go through every number in that range and find the divisors of it and print it out that. Well, you have to find the largest number of divisors within the range. Oh, yes, so you're given two numbers, a low number and a high number. And between those two numbers, you have to find the number with the most divisors and print out that number of divisors. So it's kind of a mathsy problem. A lot of them are kind of mathsy. But uh, it tells you a few things about the problem. It tells you this here, the constraints, is um, these are invariants throughout the problem. You know these will always be true. So you can use these to help you find the right answer. Mm -hmm. So you know there's, it's going to be tested up to 10 times. And you know the, the smaller one range is always less than the bigger number. You know that they're always going to be between 1 and 10 bajillion. And there will be maximum distance between them of 1,000. Mm -hmm. And for each one of the inputs, you need to print out the largest number of divisors between, those, between that range. So uh, here's so a sample. Yeah, so this is just the sample input and output. You'd be given this in the competition. So uh, they would have done out. You can see the top one just means there's five different test cases, basically. And then 1 to 10, and you have to print out the, uh, the number with the highest uh, divisors, or the highest number of divisors. So you can actually use this to step through the problem and it aids your understanding, basically. And if you write a solution to the problem, then this is the way you test it, first of all. You try the numbers they gave you, and you check if it's equal to this. If it's not, you know you're wrong straight away. You don't have to even go near the judge. So do you think you have any idea how to solve this problem? We can go back to it. <laughs> yeah. Any ideas? You can always try and brute force. You can try and brute force. How would you go try and brute force? Check the numbers from check every number and count it, like check every single number between that number and one. Check the divisor. <laughs> count the total and um, by the max. That's brute force. Yeah. You have to divide every number in every range by every number. Yeah. So. The key is to look at the constraints they gave you. They told you these facts. So you know there's going to be 10 test cases. The number is going to be up to you know, 10 bajillion. And the maximum range will be 1,000. So for each test case, there will be a maximum of 1,000 numbers between uh, the two that you need to check. That so means that uh, we can brute force it, yeah. that means. Because every time your program is run, you have a maximum of the 1,000 number, the maximum range, multiplied by 10, the number of test cases. So 10,000 is just about small enough to do the solution you were talking about. Yeah. So brute force is the dumb way of doing any problem. You just try every possible solution, see what fits, and then output that. Um, and we can write an algorithm to get the number of divisors and the number in on time. So given uh, the number of seven, it's going to loop through all the numbers from one to seven. And uh, that's, you know, it's kind of slow, but whatever. It'll work for this solution because the, um, the numbers are small enough. But then there are other ways you can optimize it. If these numbers are a bit more harsh, then there are ways you can get the number of divisors in better time. So you know uh, every divisor is a matching divisor. So when you're looking at the number 8, 2 times 4 is 8. If you know 2 is a divisor, you know 4 is a divisor. So you'd only have to go to the square root of n instead of n. And then if you start doing fancy stuff, there's probably better ways to optimize it again. So, yeah. You can always start with the brute force and then try and optimize it down. But in this case, a brute force would have uh, yeah, you just have to do the math. So it's 10 times 1,000 is 10,000, and that ON is doable 10,000 times.
So problem Not solved. Tight. So if you didn't get what we meant by O-N time, look up big O notation on big, and you might learn something. It's very important, and your lecturers will like it. Yeah. So time for a hardware problem. So this one was in the International Programme Olympiad in the year 2000 in Beijing. Yeah, so this is for a, this is a worldwide competition, but still for secondary school students. Yeah, the last problem was also for secondary school students. We didn't tell you that. Yeah. But um, I mean, they, had, they had a few like, days to solve it, and we have gave you like 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. So you, you could work through it, I hope, given time. But uh, this one, the, this was one of three problems they were given over a few hours. So let's be a bit quicker with this one. So it says that a palindrome is a string that's the same forwards and backwards. And you have to write a program that when you give it a string, it gives back the minimum number of characters you need to add to the string to make it into a palindrome. And then they give the example with this string here, A, B, 3, B, D, the minimum is two. And these being the two solutions. Yeah, you can add an A at one end and a D at the other end, and that would make it a palindrome. But there's no possible way to make a palindrome less than two characters. So that's the point of the problem. You need to work out that uh, number two. So it gives you inputs and outputs, and an example. So, so the example say, is the same as the one they give in the problem description. You just have to do it for one string. It gives you the length of the string, then the string, and you have to output the number. So does anybody have any ideas? Yeah. You go from the middle of the string, and you check the one to the left, and if that's equal to the one to the right in the middle, uh, then you will go to the one two over to the left, and if that's equal to the one on the left, you keep going. Otherwise, you append that one in between the count on the right and the uh, next one. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It, it kind of makes sense, but will that always give you the best solution? One of the best solution is, um, like, Say the first three characters in the string are a palindrome, and there's another character at the end that isn't. So the way yours would work is that it would add like three characters or something, whereas the actual real solution only needs to add one, just one character at the beginning. So it needs to work in every case. Uh, you're on the right track though, definitely. Yeah, sir. Yeah. You're on the way. So we can show you our answer mm -hmm. if you're not too scared. So this is C++, which is kind of scary in itself. Is it? Yes. With like three extra characters, it turns into Java, which is even scarier. But um, basically the thing is, you don't actually need to keep track of what characters you're adding. You only need to keep track of the number of characters you need to add. So you need to find the optimum number. So uh, this is a recursive solution, and it just, you said uh, it starts in the middle, but what would actually work is you start at either end, and you work your way in. And then um, for each of these, it tries adding a character on one end and then tries adding a character on the other end if it's not equal. And it'll just uh, it'll keep branching out and try and find all the possibilities. So it's, it's a little bit inefficient, but... Uh, and in case you know what recursive means, it means it calls itself within itself. So it kind of gets, it starts branching out. So it calls itself twice for every run itself mm -hmm. until it starts finding solutions. Yeah. So um, if you had longer strings, it would have massive big trees and branches, and that would get very slow. But it can be optimized with something called memoization. Mm -hmm. Which is not the same as memorization, as I found out about a week ago. Yes, no, it spells awkwardly. Yeah. So basically what it is, <coughs> is uh, every time you run that function previously, uh, it saves the result. It saves what string you put in, and the start and the end you gave it. And if that comes up again, then it just uh, outputs the cache result, rather than actually having to run through all of the code again. So it saves you a lot of time, because you're not calculating stuff you've already done. And it's well tailored to recursive <coughs> solutions. And it leads to something called dynamic programming. So every recursive solution can be kind of rearranged into an iterative one. And uh, that might be a little faster. So this kind of starts along that track. But, um, in general, with any, every program, you can either come up with a solution on the day or know it in advance. So, I mean, if you had never seen a palindrome before, that problem might be tougher. But if you had experience with palindromes and if you knew a few ways of working with them, then you could <coughs> along the right lines much faster. Yeah, so it's kind of boring, but practice is key with a lot of these things. It's easier to write an algorithm if you aren't making it up as you go along. Yeah, if you know it, then it's much easier to write it. 
So you have to learn algorithms. You have to learn to love algorithms. You have to learn <coughs> algorithms. And data structures are also important. Yeah, they're uh, similar enough to algorithms. You just uh, learn the logic behind how they work. So for a list, you'd want to know how the efficiency of putting something new on top of the list uh, compares with finding an element in the list, or how that compares to other data structures. So uh, you're not using a list where you could be using a set or something like that. Yeah. So, just, uh, just <coughs> so there's a lot of words there. You might be familiar with one or two. But uh, it's useful to learn the rest of them. Mm -hmm. So they come up all the time in real life programming as well. So last semester, we had to write a spell checking program. And so it was given a list of words in a dictionary, like not in a dictionary, but a list of dictionary words. <laughs> so all the real words that are, exist in English. And you had to find every word in this paragraph that wasn't in that list. You had to find the closest match to it. So it's kind of like a you know, when you type something wrong, it says this is wrong, but here's what you meant to say. And that used a list for the big list of words, a set to see if something was in that list of words without actually searching through the whole list, and then a fancy kind of tree you could do to optimize it. Yeah, so a lot of these stuff, it sounds, um, I don't know, you might be programming and you're like, how the hell is this going to help me? This is so specific. But uh, a lot of it actually will come up again. Uh, very yeah. useful. Anybody can write a program that, you know, searches through the paragraph and finds the words that are spelled wrong. But actually making it run fast enough so that it does it as you type, that's a whole other problem. So if you just try to search through all the words and you search through all the words again to find the closest one, then, I mean, that would take maybe an hour to run if you put in a novel. Whereas you expect a spell check to be like that. So it, you need to find ways to optimize it. And that applies to all sorts of code, not just this one program. In all your code, if it takes an hour to run, it's not going to help anybody. So actually learning to write fast code and efficient code is important. And you should look all this stuff up on Yahoo when you're not listening to other talks and lectures. Yeah. So That's there's a lot cool. of words there. Look them all up, or some of them anyway. You don't need to learn everything at all at once, but start with the basics and work from there. In general, this is a rule, I think. Algorithms plus data structures equals money. It's, uh, it's basic maths. Yeah, I mean. The Tom Brady actually taught us that if you're listening. So now for an even harder problem. So uh, in this one, you're given an X and a Y. But no, you're just given an X, and you have to say the Y. This one's too hard for me. So it's the, the problem says you need to find a Y such that X to the power of Y is congruent to Y mod 10 to the power of 12. So obviously this one is a very very massy one. And uh, you can see the constraints are reasonably small. It's only 0 to 50,000. 50, but uh, when you're dealing with things like x to the power of 50,000 and y is such a massive number, I mean. So in Python, you don't have a problem with big numbers. But in almost every other programming language, the, some of these numbers are too big to hold in an integer. So you need to start worrying about other things. And. Um, I mean, this one looks difficult because it's very matsy. If you actually start looking at the problem, trying a few answers, you might get somewhere further. But uh, we actually have no idea how you solve this. <laughs> uh, in the competition that it was in, in the ACM ICPC in Kuala Lumpur. Which is a, a huge competition that's like a regional competition for one of the biggest. And th this is actually for university students, not secondary school students. Yeah. So one, problem, one team got this correct. And that was because one person on that one team kind of had an idea how to do it. And he still has no idea why it's efficient. He still isn't quite sure why it works. This is a quote from one of his teammates, yeah. Yeah. So This was years later, he said, he still doesn't know. Yeah, so you can run into these kind of problems that you just have no idea. But, um, I mean, everyone is looking at these problems thinking the same thing, really. So, And it's good to come, to yeah. come across problems that you have no idea about. Because if you're doing the same thing over and over again, then that's no help to anybody. You're just redoing the old stuff. You actually need to come across new stuff to improve, to get better, and to be, keep interested. So uh, you learn a lot about this kind of you learn a lot about programming from trying to solve these kind of problems, and especially about efficiency. And listening to how other people did those problems is very important. Mm -hmm. After a competition, if you sit down with the best team in the competition and ask them how they did each thing, your mind will be blown by some of the stuff they did, and you probably won't get half of it. But then the next time you go, 
you might get a little bit. You'll remember that they did something you didn't know about before. So you'll get better and better each time. So like in everything, practice is key. If, if you can be arsed putting in the practice, you might get some of the money. <laughs> and uh, in any programming competition, choose your fights. You'll never solve every problem unless you're like way up there. So in, there's a few things you need to look at then from that point of view. So basically, um, the idea is just to pick the easiest ones. I mean, that's pretty obvious. Because uh, a lot of the time, they're worth very, very similar points to even the hardest problems. So you can just start cranking out the easy ones and then move on to the more difficult ones later. In some competitions, every problem is worth the same number of points. Mm -hmm. And so if you solve a really easy one, if another team solves a really hard one, and then you're equal. But you will have done it faster, and you'll have actually managed to do it, whereas solving a really hard one you might never get. So I mean, the first thing you need to do in any competition, like in any test, is just read all the questions, figure out which ones you have easy marks in, do those ones first, and then think about the other ones as you go along. So yeah, think about the more difficult ones uh, as you're actually coding up your answers to the uh, easy ones. So uh, in some competitions, uh, they'll run your solution against a number of test cases, and they'll have ones with smaller kind of inputs that uh, even an inefficient program can handle. So it's not a bad idea just to submit a brute force solution, even if it doesn't work for like the worst case scenario. You might still actually pick up some points. And if you're in a group competition, then it might be faster if you all take different problems, look at them individually. Maybe if you have a solution, you might discuss it with everybody else and see if they have any problems with it. But uh, you might only have one computer between like, three or four of you. Yeah, that's so it doesn't make sense to all cram around the same keyboard trying to hit all the keys. That, that wouldn't get you anywhere. That only works in the moves. Yeah. And also there's a few um, sort of cheaty tips that we can give you. So in some competitions, the sample test case they give you is one of the test cases in the competition. So if you can write an inefficient or maybe not quite correct solution that uh, gets that answer right, you might get the first point. Yeah, so, so in the... Uh, in the example from way back where uh, the problem was literally just to add two numbers together. Instead of adding two x and y, you could just add two and three, which was one of the example test cases. And you might actually get points for that. Although that might be against the rules, depending on the company. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, so with the partial marks, you know, you only have to get halfway there to get half the points. So it, like, think about it a little bit. <laughs> And so competitive programming gets difficult, but if you put in work, thought, or even the dreaded effort, then it's worth it for the dollar dollars, mm -hmm. in my opinion, anyway. So how, how do you get involved? It's a lot of places. You can go to projectutor.net or any of these sites. They all, have, uh, they all have problems on them and online judges, and you can submit them at any time, 3 a.m. Lots of people do that. Yeah. So you can take like days to solve the problem. And in a lot of them, once you solve the problem, you can see other people's solutions and compare them. And there are new things then. Mm -hmm. And Hacker Rank is legit because it's Hacker in the name. Yeah. So that one's one that to keep an eye on. That very recommended. Also, Top Coder actually literally gives you money for certain problems. So that would be worth it. And a lot of them have regular competitions. So online competitions where everybody sits down on a Saturday from, say, 2 till 6 and does three problems, and they're all ranked like against each other. Mm -hmm. And even mentioning that sort of thing on your CV might be enough, because they know you're actually in, like, involved in programming in your own time. Absolutely, yeah. There are also all these competitions. Yeah, so uh, these are online competitions, and there's a lot of uh, in-person competitions or regular competitions that are run online, uh, such as AIPO, where we took one of the problems, or Call to Code, or just uh, last Thursday, there was Google Hash Code, which was, um, which no one went to as well. And going to these in person will sometimes give you a free dinner. And at one or two of them, they even had free beers. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the AIB one, they were trying to throw the beers at us, couldn't give us enough. Yeah, they were giving us uh, so two at a time. Two at a time. Yeah, yeah it's great. Time. It is great. Highly yeah. recommend. But you're not allowed to compete in any of these because that's our turf. Oh, yeah, no, no, we have that. <laughs> but we will be organizing a programming competition here in DCU in Aiden Child Line. And it'll be sponsored by the SPAR and maybe somebody else, if you're interested. Um, so keep an eye on the Redbrick Nights emails. And look at uh, redbrick.dcu.ae forward slash uh, tilted cac forward slash comp. And I've got a list of all the Redbricky um, 
competitive programming things will be on there. Mm -hmm. So good to keep an eye on that. Yeah. So do you have any questions? And uh, you can look at the slides there as well. Um, there are uh, the USACO problems. That's the American training camp for the IOI. They all have um, problems themed around cows, which is really weird the first time you look at them. Because like you might have five problems, and every single one mentions Farmer John and his cows. And uh, I, I've seen a lot of cow problems because of that. I think I might have seen one or two shark problems. But, you know, there's a lot of problems out there. If I, if I Google shark problem, it might come up. Yeah, they, uh, you can Google shark problem. Or actually, it's zero. Ping it. Don't, don't Google Pings, it. Pings, yeah. Or Yahoo. I have, I have a question. Uh, is P equal to MP? Uh, oh. Fuck off. So, is P equal to MP? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so, so if it was, some of these problems would get a lot easier. Actually, yeah. So, I mean, if you can prove it, then you might make our lives easier. Oh, yeah. And get us to. more of that money. Who knows? If you have proved it, uh, feel free to approach us after the talk. Yes. <laughs> so, do you have a problem or a question? What was your hardest um, competition to face? So, I was in the IOI last year, and that was, uh, there were four uh, people from every country, and we were all secondary school ish. And, um, Ireland did really badly last year. <laughs> and I did the worst in the Irish team. <laughs> and the best in the Irish team was a transition year. But um, it was still worth it, if you ask him, because it was a free holiday to Kazakhstan. It was a free holiday to Kazakhstan. And all it, was paid. it was great. But some of the problems there were really interesting. And some of the problems there were really, really terrifying. And in particular, the last problem on the last day, like one person in the whole competition got it, some Russian guy, and he got it in like half an hour. Yeah, and so he was just sitting, like doing nothing for the other four hours of the competition or something. Yeah, so, so there's some, uh, some really scary people out there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in general. I know we're all from Ballymun, but like, <laughs> even further than that, there's some scary people out there. So are there any more questions? Is there any limit for the uh, programming language? Um, we talked about that at the beginning. Depends on the competition. So in most of Google's competitions, uh, there isn't a time limit. There isn't a programming language limit. So the way they work is they give you the inputs, you download those onto your computer, you run them against your solution, then you upload the output. And so because of that, you can do whatever you want on your computer. Mm -hmm. But in like um, in the AIPO, for example, you could only do it in Java, C, or C++, or I think Python this year. In the IOI, uh, last year was the first year you could use Java. Before that, you could only use C, C++, or Pascal. Yeah, C and C++ are the only really safe bets. Yeah. But C++, you'll you be guaranteed it's there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Python is becoming a bit more popular, but it's still much slower than the other programming languages to yeah, actually run yeah. the problem. Because so it's interpreted as opposed to... Even if you have a solution in Python that's like the right logic in it, it might still like take too long. But we did discuss some of that at the beginning, and you can look the slides up and read them again. And any more questions? If you don't, we have some more exciting problems. Yeah. 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 Problems. yeah. So some bonus problems. Bonus rounds, yeah. So this is uh, Code Chef is an online competition, and this was the August 2014 problem called Chef and Gift. And um, it says that today is the chef's friend's birthday. He wants to give a gift to his friend. His friend is a nerd, and. Uh, his friend likes even numbers. So he has a list, or uh, an array A, which is a list in Python, uh, of length n, and he wants to see, is it possible to give his friend a certain section of that list that has k even numbers in it? So, like, um, it, you just have to answer yes or no, is it possible? So, uh, for example, if he had the numbers, I think I have an input here, yeah, well, yeah, input is a T saying how many times it's going to be run, and then the two uh, numbers, N and K, and then it gives you the list of numbers. So it's just a standard input, and you just have to say yes or no then. And you can look at these constraints, they're all fairly small numbers, which means you can have a fairly inefficient algorithm, really. 
So, um, you didn't do that examples? No. I can't put these in the internet, so. But uh, if you think about it, if you had uh, an array that had the numbers 1, 2, 4, and 8, and you wanted to see, was it possible to give the friend uh, a subsection of that array that had three uh, even numbers? Three even numbers in a row. If you think about it, then it is possible. You can give them either uh, 2, 4, and 8, or 1, 2, 4, and 8. Because both of those have three even numbers. So the basic idea is to uh, go through the entire array and look for k even numbers in a row. And uh, the whole, you don't need to worry well, about the whole shift. It can shift. have any number of odd integers in it as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, you don't need to worry about the whole chef and gift bit. They always have a ridiculous premise to start off with. It's like, I don't know, primary school math. So Johnny walks in and buys 14 watermelons or something. <laughs> so we said back there, like, all the American problems are about cows. The cows aren't actually important in those. They're just kind of the way of explaining the problem, and it's making it a bit more fun, maybe, if you're six. But, um, like, do you have any ideas about this? So you need to have exactly k even numbers in the section of the array. So, um, yeah, there, there are a lot of ways you can approach this. You just kind of run through the array and count how many even numbers you have up to that point. And then if you want to find how many even numbers you have between that point and another point, you just subtract how many you have at the second point from how many you have at the first point, and that'll give you how many is between them. So you can just run through that a couple of times to try to figure out uh, if there are if there's a section that has exactly k even numbers. Um, it's a fairly easy problem, I think. But um, you know, it gets harder once you actually should start to try coding it because you have edge cases and things. Edge cases are when there is a small detail in the problem that you might have missed. It's one certain particular input that gives a wrong answer because it's special somehow. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of times, if you have a solution that's it seems to be working perfectly for every sort of input you can think of, but when you submit it, it's saying there's some error. It's often an edge case you've missed. So I don't know. So Sometimes for example, in this one, I might write my solution, but then what happens if they give a list of length one? It just has one number. I might not have like, written my code in such a way that that works, and so that would be wrong for that, the whole problem, just because I forgot that like, one is a number. Mm. So it's always important to uh, look closely at the maximum and especially the minimum uh, on the constraints. Yeah. Just make sure you're not missing anything like that. But uh, we'll go on to the next problem, and it's a bit more difficult. So it was in the American one, so it's Red Cows and Farmer John. And it was in 2005 Gold, so it was the highest ranked level of the competition. And it's for secondary school students, but you can also enter if you're older, which is you're just not in the competition bit. So it says that he's built a barn with N stalls in it. And uh, the stalls are located along a straight line at these certain distances that they gave you. And he has C cows, and um, they don't like each other, which I can respect. So uh, he wants to try and get them to have the maximum distance apart from each other. So what, when he lays his cows out in all these stalls, then the minimum distance between any two cows is the answer for that layout. So he wants to try and maximize that minimum distance. So um, here's the input and output. So T is just the number of tests that they'll give you. And then they'll give you the numbers N and C, so the number of stalls and the number of cows. And you need to go from lines 2 to N plus 1 with uh, where that stall is. And you need to output just one number then. Um, so any ideas about this one? It's a little unfair us putting you kind of on the spot. Usually you'd but be reading through it for a few minutes. Yeah, you'd read through it for a few minutes. But I know for a fact that CA1s covered the algorithm you need to solve this uh, last semester. So if you have any point of views, shout them out. You're too nervous, I'll tell you the answer. That's no fun. Where would we start? What? Where would we start? 
Well, what do you mean, where would you start? Where's a good starting point? Yeah. Good starting point is thinking about what you're trying to find. So you're trying to find the largest number such that that number uh, fits this problem. So that number is a valid number, of, a valid distance between stalls that fits with the numbers C and N. So if you have any idea. Uh, could you just write, first thing is to write the thing that checks and describe, yeah. and then try um, binary search? That's it exactly. So binary search, you're probably taught, was a way to find where a certain number was in a sorted list of numbers. But if you try and abstract that away a little bit, you can think of binary search as a way of finding a certain point where something changes from being false to true or true to false. So in binary search, you're saying until that point, the number you're looking for is greater than every number in the list. And then you want to find the point where that isn't true anymore. So in this one, instead of the like predicate being um, if it's greater than the number, you want the predicate to be uh, if it's possible to lay that out. And you want to find the last point that it's possible to lay out um, the cows with that distance. So, I mean, you need to kind of think about the algorithm in a different way. You need to do a lot of like jiggling in the code to make sure all your numbers are right. They gave you an input and it was like small numbers so you could actually think about it and do it on paper and everything. And that's another thing you can do with the inputs they give you. Just do it on paper and see what is your step. Like, what do you do in your head? And then try to translate that into code. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. If you didn't know binary search in this problem, you'd probably be pretty much screwed. If you knew binary search already, but not in this way, you might be able to think it through. Or the first thing you probably do is just write a brute force solution and see if it works. And if it doesn't, try to optimize it. So, uh, yeah, as you can see, like, having a sort of base knowledge of algorithms can be really helpful. Things like yeah. binary search and just basic trees. And you can kind of build off <coughs> for most problems. Yeah. <coughs> Once you get code down that works, then you start thinking about ways to make it better. Or thinking about ways, like, if your program computes something twice, then that's kind of a waste of time. So if you can find a way to not do that, then that'll speed up your solution. <laughs> so it's. Uh, maybe easier to optimize the solution you have than it is to write a new solution. Um, now, here's uh, what's called a graph problem. So if you remember last semester, Tom Brady talked about um, bipartite graphs and things. Graphs are just places like anything where there are nodes that are connected to each other. So this problem says that uh, Rahat lives in a country that has cities numbered 1 to n. And he starts at city one, and he wants to get to city n. And so um, he's given a list of all the roads between cities, but he can only go from a, from a small city to a bigger city. He doesn't like trains, and that's the only way to get from a big city to a small city. So he doesn't want to use a train. So once you get rid of some of the gibberish around it, just a few key points. He has sit, like, nodes on a graph numbered one to n, you can only go from a smaller node to a bigger node. And you can only do that if there's a road between those nodes. So the input is um, a number like less than or equal to 101 with the number of tests you're going to be given. And you're going to be given two numbers then, the number of cities and the number of roads. And if you look, the minimum number of roads is 10,000, 10 to the power of 5. And it could be more than that. So trying to like compute every possible connection isn't going to work. Yeah, because that's too big a number. Ten thousand is the big uh, input size for a more mathy problem, but for a graph problem, it tends to be uh, you tend to be looking at combinations and like factorial comes into it. So for a graph problem, ten thousand would be a very large input. And, and don't forget that your ten thousand is then going to be <coughs> up to one hundred one times. Yeah, and all of this has to happen in less than one or two seconds. So now you can see where the, the algorithms come into it mm -hmm. and optimizing your code. This would be impossible if you just did the, the basic solution. But what you can do is you can write the brute force solution and then write another solution and use the brute force one to test the other one. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they tell you that the, the number is going to be really big as well. So you need to print it modulo this. 
but uh, that's just a small detail that you can work in later. And if you don't know what modulo is, then look it up. But um, any ideas on how to solve Rahat's problem? This is the last one, by the way. Yeah, don't worry. It's this is also, apart from the impossible one earlier, this is the hardest one. Yeah. So um, graphing problems are a whole section of programming problems. And they come up all the time, and you might end up using graphs to solve something without even realizing it in your own code. Yeah. We were talking about a spell checker <coughs> that uh, <coughs> ended up being uh, an actual graph problem once you implemented a certain data structure. Yeah. And so string it comes are kind of special things. sort of graph. Yeah. <coughs> but uh, with this problem, there's a few things you should notice. You can never get from a bigger city to a smaller city. So there's never any way to say x to say x minus 1. <coughs> and what that means is that if you start at the end and start working backwards, then you can figure out how many ways there are from each city to each other city. So you know if there's a row from n minus 1 to n, then there's one way of getting from n minus 1 to n. If there isn't, there are zero ways. For n minus 2, if you look, <coughs> is there a row between n minus 2 and n minus 1? If there is, there's one way of getting there. If there's a row from n minus 1 to n, then there are 1 times 1 ways of getting from n minus 2 to n. Plus, if there's a row from n minus 2 to n, then you have an extra 1 there. So you keep working back through from n down to 1 and multiplying up. And this gives you uh, an efficient solution to this problem. Yeah, it, it's still uh, n squared, but I mean, it, you're not running every combination. If you're doing that, it would be huge. It'd take years to run the program with 10,000 inputs. But with this solution, you're just running through a whole thing like twice, kind of, inside each other. But um, that, that would be doable. And if you think about it, if you draw it out on paper, if you start like making up your own test cases that have these cities and these places and these numbers, roads from here to here, you don't have to start with test cases with 10,000 things in them, just test cases with three. Work out the smallest possible test case first and like go from there. And another tip I just remembered is in the last problem, you just have to print yes or no. In, in a problem with small outputs, if you print yes, you might get half marks. Yeah, it's a little so, bit cheesy, but. Uh, and it might be yet to rules in some competitions as well. But it's, but it's sometimes worth going for. It. You can see they, um, they, they check against that, so they made a check t times. So it's very unlikely you get T things right. So I mean, that's just something to think about in some other problems. In the AIPO, one of the problems, you can just print three and get something like 40 marks out of 100, which is a bit crazy. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if you have any more questions, or if you want to look at the slides and you missed some things at the beginning, that was about money, then uh, they're all there. And. Uh, Hope I see you at our programming competition around the corner. Also, there is a programming competition hosted by OpenNet next week, and the registration finishes on Friday. Yeah. And they've promised free food and free beer, and they want interns, I think, and it's a whole thing. Yeah, yeah. You don't even have to know how to code to get the free beer. No, you just turn up. <laughs> yeah. So we'll be there. Mm -hmm. And thanks for listening. Any final questions? Or do you want to look at our chips again?